Hello my friends and welcome to the next instalment of For the Love Of. This week it's with Alex Hoffman. Do you like music? Do you like Arsenal? Either or. You want to watch this one. So Alex currently heads up Arsenal Football Club's video division. It's a new role for him, which he explains. Before that, he's got a long career in music and some of the big parts of his career came at his time at MTV when he worked on Gonzo with Zane Lowe and then he moved to Vice and was one of the guys that set up Noisy, which was their music division. So he's worked with some incredible people, guys like Mike Skinner, as I mentioned, Zane Lowe. He's also a big fan of documentaries. Before he went to Arsenal, he went upstairs, became an executive producer for Vice and has been a part of some incredible documentary work that they've done. I've watched a lot of Vice content and I know that Alex has got his, fit, his footprint on a lot of that stuff. Very humble, entertaining, really enjoyed this conversation. One thing I must say, and it is all my bad, something happened to the video. I've been sitting on this for a while. I saw the file, but there was no, no bites in there. So this is just audio. So I'm afraid that you're just not gonna be able to see his handsome face in, its, uh, in all its glory. But here it is, anyway, for the love of music and Arsenal with Alex Hoffman. Enjoy. Thank you for agreeing to do this, first of all. Over the years, to kind of cross paths with people that do do super interesting work. And I'll never forget some of the conversations that Vicky had before we met. And then when we met, and I've seen your career kind of as an observer. So, um, so yeah, I, I, it, it seems probably a bit weird. But, um, yeah, I, I, thank you for allowing me this, this dissection of, of your working life, if you like. Wow. Um, Is that what it's going to be? <laughs> we're about to discover right um so you've done some very cool projects worked on some great shows in music and i kind of really want to understand the genesis of all of this and where it began like what was what were your earliest memories of music who is responsible for this path as well if indeed it's not yourself um wow yeah, weirdly, I'm not really, even though sort of, not all of it, but a good chunk of my career has been music focused, not so much the last sort of five years, but um, yeah, I obviously very much did music for most of it, and I, I didn't really have a particularly musical family. Um, so it's not like there was music around the house so much, or either of my folks. I mean, my sister was, was into music, um, but not in any unusual way. So, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I was just, I guess, like most kids, one of those that just gets obsessed by things and you get obsessed with it for a bit and then move on to the next one. But, um, yeah, music and football were just the two things that, that never really went away. And I was into, like, cheesy pop music like most little kids, but then quite early just got into some all sorts of different, uh, slightly more interesting things. And, and that was it, really. Yeah, especially from about, you know, dipped in and out. There was times like, I don't know, I was quite lucky as well with like the, the age I was when certain things happened, like to be like 12 or whatever it was when Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that stuff happened. It was quite good, uh, good timing. And then obviously mid, uh, when I was like teenager, Britpop um, and everything surrounding that, all the sort of, a lot of the like British dance music, uh, that went along with that scene. I just like loved all of that. And then from then on, it yeah, it never, never went away. And then that was sort of the only thing that I loved. So like at school, when you started thinking about careers, that was the only thing. I didn't know anything. I didn't really get any sort of teaching or training about what you could, what the options were. I just knew that I wanted to do something to do with music, but I didn't play any music. So I wasn't going to, you know, study actual music. Right. So just something to do with it. I didn't really know what there was. As far as I was concerned, there was only two things that I knew of because I was such a music nerd that I had, uh, you know, that was around my world. And then one was music journalism because I read all, all the magazines. Um, and the other was just like record label. I didn't know what that was or what the different jobs were, but I knew that one of those two things sounded fun. One thing that I've, I think as you talk about the age that, that we are, I think we're around the same sort of age and, and a lot of people will probably be tuning into this because they're familiar with my work with martial arts. And there is a comparison just generally in society about how we all consumed material back then. 
I speak to my coach, like the early martial arts instructionals were, were VHS and he would take stills of what he was seeing, lay them out and then invite people down and, and try and reenact this stuff. And I think the difference between some of us who were into music casually, like myself, compared to someone like you, perhaps, who really got <clears throat> underneath the skin of it, it needed a lot of effort. And I don't think people always understand that now because you couldn't just go on YouTube and even MySpace probably wasn't around in the years that we were talking. So this journey that you, you speak of and your, your development and your love for music, how much effort did you have to put into that? And what did that look like? Like on a weekend, where were you going? What were you, how were you interacting with music and who were you doing it with? Right. I mean, we are sounding a bit like a couple of old farts now, but yes. yeah, obviously at the time you didn't think of it at all as effort because that's all you wanted to do. Mm. Uh, you know, and most of the time that was music, but again, you know, football, various other things, video games when I was 13, other sports at certain times. And, you know, I was just, was just a natural sort of nerd in that way that I wouldn't just need to devour all the magazines and TV shows. But sometimes, you know, it's like when you're like a young teenager, you're like you're making your own stuff. You know, I remember like, probably shouldn't be admitting this, but like it was some early World Cup and I was like making like sort of preview, I guess like a little program, a little fanzine, like going around to some like family friends and watching the games. But I'd like make a, a little booklet, you know, with all stats and stuff. Yeah, just always a massive, massive nerd, total nerd. And then, yeah, um, what did it look like? Yeah, obviously the music press was the big thing, but definitely our price in Barnet, um, you know, got into that swing of just like Monday, you know, just like the panic of, I don't know why, because things weren't going to sell out. But like Monday, new things came out and you just had to get there as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, just got into just trying to get as much as possible and having real sort of panicky moments with like okay this is how much money i've got and i need to pick between these cd singles and like oh my favorite band's done a done a cd one and a cd two with different b-sides i'm gonna have to get both of them um so yeah quite stressful but yeah it doesn't sound very glamorous but our price in barnet was uh was important there are some other ones loppy lugs and uh record shops was a was a thing and then obviously then moving on to uni then it became uh, sort of supercharged because I didn't just have local shops. It was like Manchester city center and there was like four or five, six amazing record shops all with different specialities next to each other. Mm. So again, Monday, you know, I'd be going in doing whatever uni stuff I had to do. And then as soon as there was enough of a gap, I think I remember having like a two hour gap um, on a Monday. And so like as soon as the 12 o'clock or whatever lecture was done, I just leg it, jump on the bus, run and just try and do the whole, sort of circuit as quickly as I could and then and then get back. I love how your your weekly routine, if you like, there was there was time allocated to um procuring the the very best of new music. And that's existed uh, obviously not now, but that's gone that went through quite a few years in your kind of in your formative stages of life. That's brilliant. Yeah, I mean I you know I'm not obviously as uh, mad about it as I was when I had to run to the shop. But I still, if I'm still awake on Thursday night at midnight, I will definitely check the streaming services and see what, what new records have dropped. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just from, yeah, about 15 probably is when I started getting very into it. And then, yeah, it's just never really, never really gone away. I don't go to as many gigs and stuff as I, I used to, um, but still, it's still pretty regular. Right. I'm going to confess to something illegal now. And I'm wondering if it was uh -oh. something that was popular around, because yeah, uh, I was brought up around Watford. Uh, sounds like you were Barnet side. But my friends and I, we would get the, we'd get the cassette tapes. So we would rip those onto blanks. But then to make them look pretty, you'd go into our price or something similar and you'd steal the, the inlay card. I don't know. Was that right. a thing for you? Because it, so it I, well, it was definitely a thing, but I was <laughs> obviously too scared to do anything like that. But as far as my uh, illegal activity would go, was just um, I would just always just buy loads of yes albums, cassette albums, or maybe it was more when it moved to CDs that I would take my cassettes back, say I already had them or whatever, ah, and then just swap yes. them, or or just yeah, record them and then say so. That's that's about as illegal as about as daring as I got in my teenage years. 
Yeah, yeah. But I mean, there was I mean, a lot of that. My, mine came with a high level of anxiety because I wasn't a light-fingered chap before anyone starts... Uh, Not what I've heard. <laughs> um, you, you talk about Manchester. Um, I mean, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but it sounds like there was a, a fairly linear passage for you in music and you decided that that was obviously something that you wanted to do, but did studying take you through that avenue as well or did you do something a little different? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it was all really uh, planned. It was just that I just didn't have anything, anything else. Um, uh, uh, school was like pretty hopeless in terms of like careers. Uh, I don't know what it's like now. I'm sure it's a lot, a lot better generally. Probably not. But I, I, I was quite, um, I don't know, immature, I guess. And I wasn't thinking about careers then at all. Um, but then when at one point I sort of, you have to go to your one careers meeting. They were just like, what do you want to do? And then I was like music. So they were like, okay, here's all the best like music courses. And I was like, well, now I don't play any instruments at all. At which point they're obviously a bit, they didn't really know what to say. So they just said, get a good arts degree, just get anything arts degree, then do work experience or something and try and get in the music industry. They didn't know much about it. So the only thing I was, could really do was just like languages. So I did that. And then I guess like any, music nerds at university you just try and immerse yourself and do everything you can uh in your spare time so all the student cliches i did you know writing for the music part of the student magazine student radio uh did like a little club night um what else was there everything like that and then obviously just socially just sort of mixing with lots of lots of music people you know i went up to manchester i knew quite a lot of mates from home they're not really music people, so quite early I would just sort of, you know, get tickets for gigs and then make it my mission to find some like-minded people. Um, so, yeah, by about halfway through the first year, I had lots of sort of music mates. That's very cool. I, I think that over the years when I was thinking about how, you know, this, this chat, my, the consumption of music for me has really been dictated by my group of friends. And I had such a wide range of, I was so popular. I had, a, I had a few groups, I had a few friends, but they're very, very different. Like the guys I grew up with around here, um, they were quite into like R&B and hip hop and rap. But then I went to Watford Grammar and there was, there was more of a lean towards like indie. And, but then there was, this one, there was this one guy, and I can't remember his name, but I had a class with him. And we, we used to stay up really late. And do you remember Yo! MTV Raps? Of course. With Dr. Dre. And um, I'm going to forget, forget the, other, the other host or the other hosts. But we used to talk about that the very next day. And, it, and we used to kind of dine out in that side of things. And I used, to, I used to love that. Was that the same for you? Or did you have a couple of friends that you that just loved everything together? How did that work? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, music was definitely sort of partly how you make your friends, but all my music tastes were a bit all over the place as well. I never really sort of had one or the other. And as you say, lots of my sort of old friends were just into just general chart music or R&B. And that was kind of fine as well, because I did kind of devour all of it. You know, I really was into like the charts, even though I was always been into like alternative music. I loved like looking at the charts and trying to work out, you know, what was going to do well. And I kept sort of tabs on pop music i didn't necessarily like loads of it but i wasn't sort of i didn't like hate it it's not like i wouldn't want to hang out with people if they didn't like my cool music or whatever yeah um but yeah of course it's just uh it's more the other way around it's more like i for whatever reason found these musical passions and then hunted out people who had the same yeah. most people i was sort of hanging around with in teenage years weren't necessarily that into it so it was more me pestering them and like almost forcing them to to like it and then quite often they got into it and a lot of my old mates would end up coming to loads of sort of you know brit poppy gigs at that era because i was just playing it the whole time so they came along what was the the kind of glory genre or time when when you were growing up a particular phase of music that would just really captured the story of your youth um well i guess i've sort of hinted at it already but um i always think when you're 16 about 16 is probably the music that's never gonna nothing will ever compare 
because you can get really into stuff, but it doesn't quite have the same feeling of like the first time you're doing all of these things, the first shows you're going to. Um, so yeah, I think it's always going to be that. And I was just really lucky that when I was 16, and not just not just Britpop, but just alternative British music. So as soon as I started, you know, hearing just the early stuff, you know, just getting just the really famous stuff, you know, just thinking Blur and Oasis and that kind of stuff. But then delving into all the sort of influences that they were talking about and then a lot of newer alternative bands and then a lot of the dance music around there, you know, like obviously Prodigy was the first sort of big one. And I remember liking that even when I was quite little, you know, their really early stuff I, I, I liked. But then when Britpop happened, Prodigy were massive and then it was Chemical Brothers and then it was Left Field and Underworld and Orbital and all those kind of things. So I, I loved all that as well. It just felt like at that time, 94, 95, and onwards films as well I just felt like British uh, culture was having a real moment and I felt yeah lucky that I was part of it like even now looking back at I, I don't know if you've seen Supersonic like the Oasis doc yeah but it does make you think like wow I feel quite lucky that that happened at that time there's quite a lot of that is about the show at Earl's Court that like nearly happened nearly didn't happen and then it did and that was 95 and that was probably still probably the most memorable gig of my life just in terms of the excitement you know once i started working in music and you sometimes going to two three a week sometimes more than one a night whereas back then you know i hadn't been to that many and that was like the hot ticket and loads of you know there's like 15 of us going or whatever and i just remember the counting down the days you know it felt like i think it was like three months or something in between buying the ticket and going and you can't really compare that to anything once you're an adult yeah, it doesn't mean you don't look forward to them, but that was just like mind blowing. You know, you were beside yourself with excitement. Yeah, that that was a great time, um, and I remember some of the some of the more obscure ones. I'm trying to impress you here, Alex, with my more more obscure taste. But do you remember Pop Will Eat Itself? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that was that whole thing and Grebo stuff. They used to call it like that and Wonder stuff and. Uh, senseless things and all that. that I, never really, I never really had a moment with that, to be honest. No? I don't know why. I think maybe I was too late. I think I was maybe a couple of years before that got big. But there were definitely people at school that liked all that, and I didn't really, I didn't really know what it was. And I think and they got the top of the Pops as well. I think they yeah. had a top of the Pops appearance. I'm sure they had probably more than one. Yeah, they were quite, they were quite big. People at school liked all that. They liked the levelers. The levelers was my next one. I was like, yeah. you know, that's like folky stuff. And I, yeah, I never thought that would, that would uh, catch on because like Fleet Foxes and, and some of the other stuff that came later, just, I just really didn't get on board. But I do remember the levelers. Maybe it was to try and impress people at school like I'm trying to impress you now. Maybe that was it. <laughs> Yeah, if you're trying to impress people, I wouldn't necessarily go for levelers. To be honest. <laughs> but they, but they, they, they had a moment and they're still, they're one of those that still go going and will probably play until, you know, they're 80 and they're always going to have a solid fan base. Again, it's just people that happen to be that age at that time that are just, you can't compare, you know, the feelings you get when you're hearing that. You know, I try and keep up, you know, with new music and I do still get really get excited about new music, but it's hard not to be nostalgic when it comes to music. Yeah, and I'm, I will come circle back to this, but you are responsible for my um, my love of grime music. Seriously, <laughs> you, I'd, and I don't know why a man of my age should be engaging with this so much. But I was, you know, I've listened. I listened to a lot of radio, and I'd switched up. I'm, I'm listening to One Extra again. Like I, I, I remember when I was at the BBC when One Extra was launching, and I was like, yeah, I want to be involved in that. And I, I was never cool enough never knew enough um so when you and then you you i can't remember we had this conversation and i remember in, like chatting to you a little bit about grime music and to the day but like, real hard urban stuff for whatever reason maybe it's the crazy storytelling in the lyrics but it just pops and i i really i do really enjoy it um we'll, we'll come back to that because there's more to explore with your time at vice you got to mtv um that was where you met my wife, which is how we, we got to yes. know one another. And you worked on this show, which, which I really enjoyed. I enjoyed the whole channel MTV too as well. But there was a time at MTV where it was just such an incredible platform. And Gonzo with Zane Lowe was, was, a, was the show that I'm referencing for you in particular. How the hell 
did you manage to get yourself on that show? And then, and then I want to talk about some of the experiences because it was just a, it was a brilliant show. Well, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it was amazing, fun to work on. Unbelievably lucky to just sort of fall into doing that. Uh, what's the short version of the story? So yeah, so I, d I did uni, then I was just like looking for uh, a way in. Um, I knew I wanted it to be music stuff, but I didn't know, I didn't know anyone, you know, I didn't have like contacts or anything. Um, so I was just trying to do loads of work experience. I did a, uh, a bit, a uh, music magazine, dance music magazine that's folded quite soon after that. Then I was at a little radio station. Um, that's not about either anymore. Um, just doing bits and pieces. And then I just, I think I chatted to my sister and then she had a, a friend who was working at MTV and more on the sort of, um, commercial side. Um, and, but a good friend who I'd known, you know, for years and she was like, okay, I'll have a word. And obviously knowing now, no nap then obviously I had no idea what that means, but now, you know, it's a bit of a long shot. If someone's like, oh yeah, cool. I'll have a word. It's like, what does that mean? Like what are the chances that something would be coming up that somebody with zero experience, um, is going to be able to go for. And it was just total chance that she happened to be wandering past the, the talent department, um, there. And they have a special sort of two month internship for the, for the MTV awards, for the Europe MTV awards. And, uh, and they just were trying to hire someone for this thing and they just weren't having much luck. And she just happened to walk past, uh, the guy was like, Oh yeah, actually we really need someone to start like very soon. And we haven't seen anyone good. So quickly called me up can come tomorrow. Obviously. Yes. <laughs> Went there, had no idea, never done like a job interview really, or not one, you know, for something proper. And I'd spent my whole teenage years watching MTV. So it was all very daunting. But uh, I was just total luck, really, that it was something that didn't involve a lot of, you know, if it was like a video production thing, they'd probably be looking for, you know, a film school type thing. You know, can you yeah. use a camera? Can you edit any of these things? Um, but because it's a talent thing, which is pretty much just knowing about music and not being starstruck. And it's hard to sort of get that across, but they're basically like, you're going to be, you know, if you get the job, you're going to the MTV awards and you're going to be like carrying towels for, you know, massive pop stars. Uh, does that weird you out? And I just had to try and convince them that, um, no problem. As exciting as it would be, I'm not the type to just sort of freak out and start asking for photos and stuff. Uh, anyway, got that blah, blah, blah. And then very quickly realized that like MTV two was sort of the, the place in the company that I wanted to be because they were, doing the best stuff um and yeah i think gonzo i don't think it started when when i started but like shortly after that it started and then i was sort of in the business got to know those people and then yeah eventually um a job popped up like a junior like channel assistant it was like production and also scheduling obviously not scheduling the whole channel but like assist assisting on everything basically so yeah did that and then eventually like gonzo was every day at that stage every weekday that is bonkers as well. Like to be able to yeah. turn the show around every day like that. Yeah, it's crazy. That's mental. It was like recorded in, I'm trying to think now, it must have been early. I think it must have been like 10.30 or something. You just like rattle through all these links. Then you run off to an edit suite down the road, edit it in, I think you had an hour uh, to just chop these links. Because you're not really editing so much. You're just chopping down these links, just finding the ins and outs. There's not a lot of, uh, there wasn't so much creativity getting packed into the links. It was just, you know, a fairly straightforward job, run back, put it in the system. And then it went out, I think at five till seven, just little clips in between four music videos. And yeah, I think I was just like lucky really. Someone was away and they were like, Oh, would you want to do the floor? Which is basically means you just, um, they mic you up, you stand behind the camera and you just sort of knock about with, with Zane. I guess it's a bit sort of like podcasts and stuff now. Um, it was a very loose show, as you would know if you saw it. It was kind of just Zane chatting about music and also just just pissing about. Um, and obviously very daunting to do that at the beginning, but very quickly sort of got on with him quite well. We had lots of music stuff in common. Um, yeah, and so that obviously helped, the fact that I had that sort of relationship and I was starting to do, do the floor um, meant I just sort of, yeah, stuck around. And um, yeah, it's funny... Uh, like to having just started at Arsenal and like have so many people just say to me like, Oh my God, that must be your dream job. And then, yeah, I do think that I'm, I've just been extremely lucky in my career that I've sort of had, you know, a few dream jobs. And at the time to be in my mid twenties and be looking after that show 
but also doing there was probably like five six years where i did south by southwest festival in in texas every year did um bene Cassim in spain every year um we did gonzo tour where we'd like actually be on a tour bus um going around the uk and you know not necessarily glamorous but like so much fun such amazing people that i worked with um and just filming bands every night and other festivals would do, yeah reading and leeds would normally do uh, great escape in brighton rock hammering in germany sometimes and you just sort of got used to getting into that cycle and then sometimes you'd stop and just be like oh my god if i was 16 and someone would tell me in 10 years time i would be going every year like as a job to south by southwest you know a thing that i just read about in in magazines and it sounded like the crazy you know it's basically disneyland for music geeks so yeah it was it was a really fun time and he's a special talent is zane i i, I used to tune in to him regularly um on his bbc show i was on board was that his thing are we on board yeah. such as that is yeah, on board. very good his energy was very good and and one of the things that i don't think that he gets a lot of credit for just generally speaking maybe it's again because i'm a bit of a geek about interviews but his style of interview is very very good very good and it obviously comes from the confidence in he has with with the music and you earn credibility with your peers but that was something that really really stuck out for me um yeah What's i mean it, ma it made it sorry i was gonna say it made it very uh, easy for me like i was very fortunate because the end product of the show it might not have been the most polished show but that wasn't the, the point especially when he was doing his sort of more polished radio show i think he definitely felt like mtv was a place where he could come and really just have fun um so i was very lucky that the, the end product people were like oh that's a cool show but i wasn't really producing it very heavily i was researching and sort of getting the bands on and coming up with ideas but all of the sort of ninety percent of what made it good was just what Zane was like, and that was just he's such a just completely natural broadcaster. Like he doesn't have to like train or anything. And interviews is is amazing how he would remember all these things. And what basically made the show was that you could see artists, um, you know, uh, not to sort of have sympathy with artists, but you know, sometimes the promo treadmill can be quite draining. I think you know you you're probably playing the show flying playing a show, after party, uh, and then you get woken up super early to do, you know, some breakfast radio or TV, and then basically back to back all day, just answering the same questions nonstop. So you really notice when artists were sort of get Brent brought through and they were looked half asleep and then they sort of look up and then see Zane in the couch and they're like, oh, okay, this is like a fun one. This doesn't feel like promo, you know, hard work. This is fun. And that made it super easy for us. I, I don't know if you guys really understand how much that has impacted uh, uh, conversations that a lot of people have had because you talk about it not being this overly produced and it's not the most polished product, but it didn't mean that it wasn't compelling, entertaining, educational viewing, which still delivered that really impactful interview with the subjects. And like my, my broadcast partner and I, Dan, Dan's very much of a Zane Lowe mold. He is like, he's, he's a genius of the fight world, it, you know, he, but he did fight himself. I know Zane used to play as well. He, he was a DJ and whatever else. So, so they're in that same kind of mold. And we, we sort of grapple with networks and perhaps our employers sometimes about, let's just do this. It doesn't have to be polished. And everyone's like, no, it has to be polished fuck the shiny desk, give us a sofa, a couple of microphones, rotate people in, show them leaving. Like, let's just be real. Let's not cover it up. And the, the couple of times when we've done it and it's been really fun, people have loved it, but sometimes we haven't had the buy-in. But what's, and this will segue a little bit to, to your work on Vice. What I like about Vice is again, yes, you can do really lovely polished stuff. Some of the series that you do, I think is, guided the way that people put documentary formats together but also there's just handheld stuff which is getting as many views because it's real you know and, and i think that gonzo proved that you didn't have to have bells and whistles did you know that and has that been feedback that you guys have had you know a good few years on I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't get asked or I don't hear people talking about Gonzo that much anymore. I guess it's quite a long time and you had to have the channel. But I definitely think 
uh, you know, now you mentioned, I would love it to have been this era where it could have been, you know, on YouTube and a podcast and just available to absolutely everyone. Um, cause I think it could have, yeah, it could have been a lot bigger than it was. Um, yeah, if it was around now for sure, or even if those things were available now, you know, there are some clips and stuff on, on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I'm a bit, jealous of that i guess that like anyone can start a format and in theory you can get it out to absolutely anyone in the world whereas it was uh you know when i was there it was a time where like digital stuff was starting to happen but most of the people in charge were understandably it was just all very new and it felt a bit scary like you didn't want to put stuff just out there for free because the whole point was of you know uh, satellite tv cable tv was that you know you have to get people to pay for this product and if you start putting all your good stuff out you know, this is even before social media, but if you start putting out on websites, also it just felt so weird. People were like, no one's going to really watch anything on, on the internet. It was the same with Vice. When I was at MTV, but seeing Vice starting to do videos and they were like long and people were like, I don't know. I just do, when you hadn't ever sat down and watched something for a long time on the internet, it just seemed, it just seemed really foreign. It's like, I'm not going to pull up a chair and watch something for 20 minutes on the internet. Um, luckily Vice thought they would and uh you know luckily they were right and i was wrong before we get to vice um when you're at mtv was that the time of richard blackwood and was russell brand around at the same time as well sadly richard blackwood no i think uh i don't think so i mean my first year or two at mtv was sort of in the other office not where the studio was oh, so there may have been some crossover but Richard Blackwood was more, I think, mid late nineties in terms of like select. That was more when I was a, a viewer rather than an employee. Right. I am shy my um, I just remember him dan he was presenting a live show, but dancing his way through it. It was super entertaining. I don't know what he's doing now, but I was kind of he, jealous of him. I think he's in EastEnders, isn't he? Is that what he's doing? I don't I think so, doing. yeah. Terrible. No, I don't, but I had heard that. But yeah, I think he's still I think he's doing all right. Oh good. Uh, or maybe it's Hollyoaks. Might be Hollyoaks. I can't remember. But he's doing all right. Don't worry, don't worry about Rich. But yeah, I mean, for a, for a few years there, they were really marketing him as like the sort of Will Smith, you know, that he was sort of yeah. the, the, the TV personality, but also he had a, he had a music career, uh, relatively short, but you know, I'm sure you've got, I'm sure you've got some of those records somewhere. Um, <laughs> Russell Brand, yes, uh, a little bit. Russell Brand, I think was a bit before my time for his original, you know, he did a sort of initial spell where he yeah. used to do dance floor chart where he'd just go to clubs and chat to people that were worse for wear yeah that was before my time but people i knew worked with him so when he uh sort of started to get better i think he was out out sort of rehab and all that stuff for a while and then when he came back around not working at mtv but just sort of about i remember going to one of his first like comedy things he was just trying out some comedy stuff above a pub in camden so a few of us went down um just to sort of support there's probably like 50 people there and then obviously he went on to be enormous. But then when he was sort of mid getting enormous, MTV got him back to do like a, a kind of talk show, sort of big show thing that was didn't last that long. Um, but yeah, so he was about a bit, but not well. He wasn't someone I sort of uh, socialised with in the pub after work with him. Okay, so you get to Vice. H how did that come about? And was it? simply just a, a desire for a new challenge or were you kind of plucked from MTV and you're our guy type deal? Uh, sadly, not the, not the latter. Um, I mean, it's a fairly boring story, but yeah, so I was doing Gonzo and just general MTV festivals and tours and everything for a while, loved it. And then eventually they outsourced the production to a production company. So we were still making MTV shows, but we were out in um, Portobello Road uh, with another company, Remedy Productions. And it was sort of about that point where it was all starting to change and you could tell Zane was sort of getting a bit like, everything was sort of uh, analysed a lot more and he really liked the freedom and it had this real sort of cult show feel where we could just sort of kind of get away with anything. Um, and then once sort of lots more people got involved and some of the people involved weren't necessarily real sort of alternative music people, they were a bit more just sort of um, general tv entertainment people and uh yeah anyway it just started to get a bit less you you really felt like you you've sort of passed the golden age of 
MTV being a place where people would really go to for like great stuff and especially music things. They've obviously still had some good success with reality TV. Um, so yeah, it just started to sort of started to get a bit less interesting and I really loved Vice, but they didn't really do much music stuff, but I had some connection with them. I knew some people who worked there eventually got a chat with someone and they were like, yeah, we don't do a load of music stuff, but you know, things pop up from now and again. And eventually something popped up that sounded really good compared to what I was doing at, for, for MTV, which was starting to get a bit less exciting, a bit less sort of in terms of for music nerds. Um, and they had a really good project. It was only for a few months, but at that point I was sort of done. So I was like, okay, I'll just take the plunge and, 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 and go for it. Um, so yeah, so I did that for a couple of months and then I was then, you know, I was then about to go and just sort of help Zane with some stuff. He was like doing a lot of his own, bits and pieces had started his sort of like own website. Um, so I was just going to sort of help him out for a bit. And then um, they were like, we're about to launch a whole music uh, channel, basically a vertical. Um, do you want to help sort of just in the initial first few months of it? I guess this would have been 2010. Um, so I was like, yeah, okay, why not? So I started that and obviously ended up nearly 10 years um, and, and doing music only really for the first six or seven. What was the, what, what were those early days like? Because I, I remember Vice and it was so different. Well, it appeared to be different to me. And I would, I actually would have been probably a little bit intimidated by the environment there. So what, did, was there trepidation when you went over there? And was, what was the, the cultural differences that you were experiencing? Um, yeah, for sure there was a little bit of that. I mean, I, I, I guess I'd worked pretty much since university in for one place so a little bit like what i'm experiencing now um you know to be somewhere for so long even though we went to this production company i was still surrounded by all the normal you know my usual work colleagues so that was a culture shock for a start that it was completely new people yeah of course sort of vice had this you know reputation that it's all very cool or whatever but um i guess like most places it's never it's never what you imagine it to be. It was the same at MTV when I was a kid and walking in there, I was like, oh my God, it's going to be, I don't know, you imagine it to be something and it's not quite, I mean, most of the people there were just, they were just really nice, really smart, driven people. Um, not to say they're not, I don't know, it's weird talking about how cool people are or not, but like, I, I didn't really uh, feel that. I totally understand if you come from a, a much more corporate background and you walk into yeah. our office, you're like, oh, this feels full of, young people you know and they dress a bit different you know they're not wearing <laughs> suit and tie but it wasn't so wildly different from you know mtv uh, everyone everyone seemed nice enough you've you have you have however gone from an established channel massive backing where you're working on probably a couple of things now it sounds like you're growing an entirely new brand with this huge amount of scope which for me, when I get offered little opportunities in a micro sense where, where all of a sudden I've got, I need funneling down. Um, when you start, how do you start something like noisy? Like how, how does that even work? Well, I think I do have to sort of preface this with I don't want to make out as if like I started the sure, whole thing. Sure. And, and you have the backing, you know, and you're saying like, oh, the early days of Vice. I don't know. I don't really consider myself someone that was there at the real early days. By the time I joined, um, it definitely wasn't as big as it, it is now by a long shot, but it was already like a proper company. You know, like in the beginning, it was really renegade. There were like three or four people running around trying to make everything happen. By the time I joined, it wasn't huge, but it was still like, you know, they had a proper agency there, you know, uh, working with brands and, um, and they had some fairly experienced people. They were in a run of sort of trying to get people from TV and from more established um, backgrounds um i can't remember what your question was now yeah so you you, you probably can't either no i can no so i, I was just <laughs> trying to trying to gauge how you when you oh yeah how we start noisy right so yeah so there was already this this background of stuff so it's not like um you know it's daunting obviously i had to contact uh the artists like at mtv i'm very much used to have, having a talent department so i knew what artists uh i wanted to work with or we wanted to work with but then you go to the talent department, they talk to the labels, it's all very organized. Whereas advice, they didn't have a talent person. 
So you have to reach out to people. You have to make new contacts, more like online PRs and managers and sometimes direct to the artist. But it's not like going in and saying, hi, we're starting this new thing called Noisy. Do you want to be involved? Because obviously people are going to be very wary and they're like, let me see some stuff. You know, I don't want to be the first one to get involved. But Vice was already pretty established. Mm. It wasn't, you know, enormous. wasn't, you know, the, obviously now it's got whatever, tens of millions of subscribers on YouTube. And, you know, you, a lot of your average people at least have heard of it. They're familiar with what it is. Um, but people in music knew what it was, especially like back then the magazine was more of a big deal and they did do like album reviews in the back of the magazine. They were, they weren't serious. They were sort of a bit of a piss take, but it's still people in music knew what it was. They were like, okay, that's a thing. So it wasn't as hard. Um, but I don't know, I guess uh, to me, it didn't seem, it seemed fairly clear like what, what we could be doing because the, you know, the, they'd had some funding. We had some half decent amount of money to make some music things. And it seemed fairly clear what was well, certainly what we shouldn't be doing. Cause it was at that point where everyone, every music outlet was just like, Oh, we need to get onto video, but they weren't necessarily video people. So a lot of it was just standard. It was just interviews and it was acoustic sessions. So I was like, okay, well let's just definitely not do either of those. Um, and then I don't know. Yeah, I guess we just did a mixture. We hadn't really got into docs then. We were just trying to find, you know, just unusual content, the kind of stuff that's fairly, you know, very commonplace now, Mm. but because Vice already had a history of doing those things, it was kind of just trying to mirror the, the, um, energy and feeling of, of Vice across all its other areas that it covers and just putting that into music and, you know, not everything succeeded. We tried all sorts of little things, but then some things really, uh, you know, did really well. And people thought it was like amazing and new. And it didn't seem that amazing and new to me. Um, it seemed like the obvious thing that you should, you should do. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a really good time to be like, okay, right, we're going to get stuck into YouTube. Uh, for about the first year or so, it was a different story. But then at 2012, I think they're like, right, we're launching a new YouTube channel. We're putting some budget behind it. Um, we need to make noisy YouTube a thing. Um, and it was, it was great. People wanted to work with you and it was great just to focus really on the, the characters, you know, like in MTV, it was a bit more like, well, you have to just get the people who are the popular artists at the time. Whereas this was a lot more free advice and it, it was really quick to realize that it doesn't really matter how big the artist is. If they're not that charismatic or they don't necessarily want to be on camera, just filming an interview with them isn't going to be that interesting. Whereas some of our biggest films we ever made at Noisy didn't have anyone famous in them. Um, it's much more, you know, about the story and the characters and the personalities and all that. One of the things that you mentioned just there, um, which is a big thing for me, which you said we did a few things, some of them failed, some of them didn't. But culturally, I think that really must speak to, to Vice as the environment because you can't be in every company and have lots of failures or even some failures. There's such a culture of fear uh, and you, you then, it stifles your creative ability because you, don't, you can't afford for something to fail. What did they do very well at Vice which allowed you guys to be more creative and, and have this, this more open forum where you could try new things? Well, uh, you know, they've always been known for that. Uh, they were incredibly uh, free with me and my team in terms of what we wanted to do. Um, I think I was quite fortunate in that it was they were really had been starting to do loads of docs and stuff in the years running up to that. So in terms of sort of more newsy, hard hitting documentaries, that was a lot of the a lot of the people they hired um, or were just around the company were really focused on that. They didn't have a particular music person. So I think I was a bit fortunate in that, that they didn't have a music expert, for want of a better word. So they kind of let me get on with the UK stuff anyway. They had lots of great music people in the States. So to a certain extent, I was left alone. But also I think it's different from, say, TV, where there's just this established way of working. Everything there was so new. And suddenly YouTube, like, right, this is going to be, YouTube is going to place where we're trying to get people to watch it there was nothing to judge it against. You know, when we put up the first couple of pieces and they're getting 10,000, we're like, oh, that's, is, good? is that good? I don't know. And then suddenly we did something, uh, you know, that sort of start kick off and it gets, you know, 300, 400, 500,000. Oh, okay, maybe that's 
good. Uh, maybe we should, we need to be getting that every time. So, um, yeah, they were really great in terms of the sort of freedom they allowed us to sort of try things out. But we were also quite lucky that things started to do quite well, quite quickly. And it felt, felt like there wasn't really that many direct competitors. So a lot of the artists were like, well, no one's really making sort of docs. Once we started more into making docs, people wanted to come and do stuff with us because no one else was really doing it. Um, <clears throat> was the documentary stuff natural for you? It's, it's, a, it's a format that I've, that I absolutely love. I've produced a couple of my own with, with, you know, in, in my space, not my space, uh, in, in the space of um, martial arts. And, and I love it. And I, I look at, documentaries like the defiant ones is one that i could watch 10 times over i love the edit i love the way they've put it together the access um sorry i'm geeking out on documentary style but were please you, mate i could do that all day were, were you into that kind of thing as well yeah for sure um so yeah that's why when i'm saying i've been extremely lucky you know like my things in life are basically music documentaries and films and and football right so to be able to have sort of combined all of those you know i'm definitely very fortunate yeah so docs i'm trying to think even like uh even from like football docs and when i was younger uh and i remember watching the when we were kings the muhammad ali doc probably at uni but yeah i just have always been super into sort of feature docs especially and you know going to cinema to see them um so yeah and maybe not natural in terms of i hadn't uh made them before going to vice um but yeah no one sort of said well you can't because you haven't made them before um i don't think it's such a i mean it's of course it's really hard to be the best be really good at something but in terms of making a doc there's no reason why anyone can't make it if you know the subject if you're passionate about the story that you're telling it's not um there's no some particular secret to it i mean some of the best docs or certainly most popular docs and not even necessarily amazingly well shot or put together. It's just they happen to have stumbled across a mad story. Yeah, like hoop dreams. I'm not actually saying about the quality of the way that it's put together, but yeah, so amazing. We've discovered that story so early on, but also as a documentary maker to hold on to that, like that mm. that treasure chest for so long, and to see it yeah. as a linear project that to me blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, there's a few other examples of that way. You know, if you look at what what is it about the best docs, and of course, it's stumbling across an amazing story. Uh, you know, access. Uh, there's all sorts of luck with the timing of that people are, uh, are talking about that story. But of course, one of them is just the amount of time spent. You know, loads of people probably get a bit of access, hang out with someone for two days, and be like, "Oh, I don't understand. I don't know why I didn't get anything groundbreaking." Um, whereas if you follow someone for years and years, which is why there's almost no uh, documentary makers that can make a living out of it because if you really want to put everything into it you need years and years i mean look at uh, you know the netflix one making a murderer was supposedly yeah. over 10 years i think to put that together i'm sure they weren't only doing that for 10 years but still uh dig one of the legendary like music docs i don't know if you've ever seen that but that is another one that's like on and off but like yeah years and years of just like following just on the tour bus just there must be days and days of just complete boredom just to get that one bit. And then obviously eventually they all start like fighting each other and it's like, wow, we've got, we've got gold here. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, for every one of those, there's thousands of others that people spend years making and nobody ever sees them. So it can be a thankless task, but amazing when they work out. Sure. What was the first one uh, with your tenure at Noisy that, that really you, you were very proud of and maybe it's, it maybe may have done well, maybe not, but what were you particularly proud of one of the early ones? Well, I can remember in terms of just the, the sort of longer ones that I did, obviously we were constantly making like, I guess, mini docs, little packages, pieces the whole time. But in terms of what really felt like a doc, I was quite lucky that I was always doing music for the first five or six years, but quite early on, they had an idea to make a football doc. Uh, and there was, again, a bit like music, there wasn't many football people about, and they knew that I was a, a football fan, so they, uh, um, they got me to do that. Normally, it was all ideas that I'd come up with, but this was one where they just needed someone to, to make it. So I worked with some friends to make a piece about the Rangers and Celtic rivalry. Right. Um, so that was really big for me. It was like it ended up being about, about 45 minutes, I think. 
um, did really well because obviously football stuff is just super popular. Um, and even now, I think it was 2012 it came out. But even now, the couple of people I make it with will like send a little tweet or something they found every once in a while. There are some Rangers and Celtic fans who will have like a watching party for it, like before any old firm game. They'll like get it back out again and, and, and watch it. Um, so that was, yeah, that was really good to do that. And also good to get outside of music. And were you, were you actually on the ground making this, this documentary yeah. or were you, oh, you were? Cause yeah. So in that era, I was, I was on the ground the last sort of, yeah, three, four years, a bit more sort of commissioning and exec producing and, you know, emails and in the office and all of that. Okay. But back then I was, I was on the ground most of the time. Yeah. That is because that's a brave space to walk into. And I think that goes for a lot of the stuff that um, you guys did at, at Noisy. I, I, I love the stuff that Mike Skinner got involved with. Um, there, was a, there was a documentary series as well that there, a, li a little American dude used to go all around the world and it introduced me to Barley Funk. Okay, yeah. And to the day, I use that, like it's, we have a lot of Brazilian fighters and okay. I, I pull up Spotify when we do like I, I produce like the shadow boxing sequences that they have for the, the packages before they walk out. So to, to get the, the room more in tune with the vibe of the team, I'm like, you know, what would you know, would you like some, uh, some barley funk? And they just look at me and I could remember a couple of the artists as well. And, uh, and I got a few laughs on that, but I actually enjoyed it. Um, yeah, amazing. But it was brave. A lot of the stuff was brave going into places that like I'd, secretly like to but i don't think i've got the asshole for it and i think rangers mm. celtic is another one of those it's it's just such a deadly ground at times isn't it yeah well it's funny whenever people uh you know if i say that i was working for vice and make docs everyone was like oh my god you guys are so brave and i have to be the first one they're like i'm definitely the least brave person that's ever worked there so i obviously music stuff is a bit less uh you know hairy most of the people that are doing very brave stuff in uh, advice are doing sort of uh newsy things you know there's mm -hmm. loads of war zone stuff happening yeah. or or just or crime things uh stuff which i've got into more recently in terms of work but um more exec producing not on the ground so that was yes that was probably the sort of hairiest um doc that i worked on and i remember getting on the train for the last time we did about i think we did about four trips up there um and i remember getting on the train the last time and to having a bit of a you know deep breath and thinking like we got we got away we sort of got through that but um only because i'm yeah just not very brave the others were just like this is fine you know we were sort of going around some fairly like sketchy parts of people are super friendly and you know there was times where people were sort of messing with us a little bit but um it was okay, yeah, compared to what a lot of people do. You know, some people are you know, going to actual war zones. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a couple of guys that work with the UFC that have done war zone stuff, and I've worked with some crews that have been on the news, the news front during war times, and it, it's so brave, you know. It, it really does. It, when you think that's how you earn your living, and, and actually people, friends of those or, or colleagues have lost their lives as well. And you're like, holy shit, all in the name of, of journalism. It's, it, it's just, it's crazy. Um, but one of the, as someone that does a bit of producing work now, I did a, a talk with a fighter. Uh, sadly, it didn't go out because the fight re recently got pulled. And we did a talk at a school and the paperwork, just because we were dealing with minors, we had to, I, I kind of did a, did a backup. We filmed it a certain way that we never would put any of these kids in shot necessarily backs, backs of heads, etc. But then we also got some other cutaways anyway. Um, it, we never got the sign off. It was all so complicated. And I think back to the Blackpool um, mini doc you did with those, those kids, the, the, like the little grime artists that were maybe like nine and were <laughs> sending for one another. And, and I think about the, the release forms and all that kind of thing. How the hell did you guys do that? And, and how risky did you find it? Not, not going out there with a the camera, but they're kids, you know, and social yeah. media, the way that it is, did, was there a moment where you thought we shouldn't do this with like, do, do you know what I mean? Like the psychology. Definitely. Of yeah, definitely. And, and those sort of 
conversations for sure happen and they happen with so many of the docs that we used to make at, at Vice. Um, because yeah, sometimes people don't, you know, it happens a lot. People sometimes don't really fully think it through. I mean, I think that the whole time just watching TV, there's so many things on TV with members of the public where I'm like, I get why it's a good, uh, you know, a watchable piece of TV, but why, why were you, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, from like, I don't know, embarrassing bodies or, I don't know, there's so many things to do with, you know, health or um, just weird situations where you're just like, I don't really get the, or, you know, just do, do the people involved, have they fully thought through, um, you know, what they're doing here? And we really have to take that responsibly very seriously because we know what it's like on Vice. You can put out a film, it can get millions of views on YouTube, and then it can get clipped out, memes, GIFs. Suddenly it's like, you know, some Facebook clips that we've put up have had like a hundred million views Jeez. and then they get ripped and put in all different places. Like once it's out there, it's, it's out there and you can just mm -hmm. become, uh, you know, just someone like funny on the internet for people to laugh at. And especially when you're talking about minors, it is something, yeah, it was a very long process and, uh, yeah, one that was definitely moments where we're like, I don't think this is going to happen because, um, yeah. Cause when you're talking with anyone vulnerable, uh, you have to take it all very seriously. So, um, I mean, there's there's a long answer to it. I mean, the short one really is just obviously involving the the families, the parents. The parents have to be fully involved. We have to get them to watch it. You know, they uh, we don't you don't normally want people involved watching things before they yes. go out yeah. because obviously it affects the integrity of thing. But there are exceptions, and especially when it comes to minors or anyone vulnerable, it's like you'd much rather them watch it all than put it up and then be nervous, thing like wonder how they're gonna take it yeah so yeah it was it was a long process but i mean ultimately it's yeah getting the parents involved getting them to watch it before and then when we were having these conversations where like you know our sort of safety people would be like do they really know you know are they aware that you can get nasty comments on on social media that can have more of an impact than you think you know if you ask anyone say like oh well, some people are going to say some nasty stuff about you online you just think okay well you know I'd rather they didn't, but like, I'm fine. I can handle that. Mm. But you don't really know until it actually happens. How, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure, you know, do you know I mean anybody in the public eye? <laughs> yeah. I don't mean because I've, I've heard that you're a target, but anybody at all who's in the public eye for anything, uh, you know, for whatever reason people feel, feel the need to, uh, and it's normally people that actually like them that are fans, but feel yeah. the need to say things for whatever reason. So yeah, it was nervy, but I think what I, I said, like I remember one conversation sort of towards the end when we were getting ready to launch it and we were sort of uh, nervous, but had spent a long time thinking about all these things and doing everything that we could to make sure everyone was fine, was that these kids were already kind of an inter very internet meme -y thing. And there was like a million little videos by YouTubers saying like, these are the worst people in the world. Um, and just being horrendous. And I was like, I know our doc has some raw moments and funny moments and stuff, but I, th I felt like it was also f kind of uh, human. You know, I, I was like, it's the first time ever really that they've been considered as human beings and not like an internet meme. So yeah. I was like, in the grand scheme of things, this is the like least sort of trolley thing that's ever happened in their life. And I'm, you know, you're hopeful that as much as some people will think they're funny and want to you know, say mean stuff about them and on the internet there might be people who a like the doc or they might even get into their music who yeah. knows um it was just a really good story that we were like we can't really not try and do this but let's just try and do everything we can to make sure everyone's happy and you know they're pretty tough pretty tough people you know we got them all we did two films we did a one year later sort of follow-up but the main one we did like a uh, a screening and we had the families and stuff there uh, some of them and including parents of kids who like had said absolutely horrendous things about each other and about each other's parents and they're just like it's just kids you know like I mean I've got to say they weren't nine you know like they're more like yeah I guess 13 is probably the youngest okay so um, but they were pretty uh, yeah they're pretty they're pretty tough and I think all told like we never had any word from anyone involved in in the films uh, that they were anything other than really happy that, that they happened.
That's great. Uh, I, were you around still when, because there's a crossover with, with My World, Your World. Did you do the, the Popek video with, um, who's your man, Chucky? Is it Chucky? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so th that was one of yours? Yeah. So He's that series was mad like the last thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, we knew that. I'll tell you a little story because people can, uh, th th they can watch that. And maybe I'll, I'll link a couple of these through. But one of my early experiences of going to fight shows, one of my coaches was fighting on a show called FX3, which was in Reading. Popek was the main event. And he was, already, he was pretty big back then. I mean, this is a while ago. This is, this is over 10 years ago, I think. Anyway, my, my coach has won, moved on, and, and he's now kind of washed and ready. I think I might have driven him up there, or I, I'd taken a bunch of people up in my car. And Popek came out, long story short, he, start, he was starting to lose the fights, but he had some serious support in this leisure centre, because this was early, earlier days in UK mixed <clears throat> martial arts. Then there was a lot of alcohol fueled Englishmen that started singing terrible songs like national songs and goading the polish he wasn't fighting a i don't think it was i think he was fighting a dutchman uh popek anyway he started to lose and then this place went nuts they were ripping the fucking seats up throwing it at the cage people were getting chairs in the face and we'd already made our way to the emergency exit when it was going off and i just remember jamie who is probably the most promising fighter that we had on the team he'd forgotten his coat and it was right back down at like the epicenter of the, all of this craziness. And he like crawled along the floor, uh, military style, grabbed his, his coat and then got back out. We got into the car park and behind us, cars are getting turned over, fire extinguishers going off. And they actually banned MMA in that, that region, like in, um, is it Berkshire in, in Reading? Oh, it was mental because of him. And that was my first introduction. And then I've obviously, being in the scene, I've heard more about him. What a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, I'd, uh, I'd been wanting to do something with him for ages. Um, I'd met him very briefly because I don't know if you know, he was sort of involved in like grime world as well. Um, okay. He was, yeah, he was doing, because he was living in England for a while and uh, yeah, he was doing music and he was quite close with a few of the MC. So when we were filming a thing with, with Big Nasty, I think this would have been uh, 2014. Um, he was just about, you know, he was just about like backstage with his top off. And obviously all of us were just like, who is that absolutely terrifying person? And uh, they were like, <laughs> oh no, he's a, he's a sweetheart. You know, yeah, quick right. chat. It was really nice. Um, seemed really sweet. And then I was like, yeah, he seems like he's got a good story. So he's always been at the sort of back of my mind that I wanted to do something with him. And then, when we were, yeah, one of the last sort of, probably the last big sort of series that I worked on was Gangster Rap International, which had been in my like list of series for like five, six years. I was like, I don't really know what it is exactly, but we should do something like this, looking at rap scenes or people from around the world. Um, and then, yeah, once we started to actually develop that and we realized Chucky was the person to host it, we were just going through all sorts of people. And then I just, yeah, I don't know. I just thought about it. I was like, well, we could do this guy. And they were like, well, what's his story? I was like, well, I don't know exactly what he's doing now, but I know that he sort of lives in Poland. Uh, he's Polish and he's like running. At that point, he was getting into politics. He was trying to be, you'd be really get into politics in a major way. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, and then there's this side. Oh, and he's mixed martial arts. Oh, and he did Strictly Come Dancing over there. Oh, and he sliced up his face. And he's tattooed his eyeballs and I just saw on and on. And then I was sort of, as I'm saying it, I'm like, yeah, we should definitely go and make this. He seems like an interesting person. And also like the same with Blackpool, just trying to get under the skin a bit and find a bit more sort of about the human and human aspect. And, you know, there's moments in that. Obviously people remember all the wild stuff of him driving around like a lunatic and terrorizing um, Chucky. But also there's moments where you start to get an idea of his background and, the sort of traumas that he's been through that may have uh, caused his life to become quite uh, colourful, should we say? Yeah, yeah. As a as a creative person, then how how do you dive into that process? How do you let the muse come in, so to speak? Uh, I mean, it's quite a difficult question. You know, I don't even almost like it sometimes when people are like, "Oh, you're a creative," because I've you know everywhere I've worked, there's people that like 
just seem very shy, you know, to come up with ideas and stuff. You know, I'll be like, okay, everyone send me stuff. And there'll be people that just would never reply. And then you can tell if you like talk to them, they're like, oh yeah, I'm not, that's not, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not one of those people. And I've never really understood it. It's like anyone can come up with a good idea. So I've never really thought like, oh, I'm this creative person who has these great ideas. Every time it sort of happened uh, that we've done something really successful, I've never thought it was like some mind blowing thing. Obviously part of it with music is just knowing the music and that's not because I've decided I need to investigate. It's just because I love it anyway. You know, I'm lucky that I've worked in worlds where I'm following that thing anyway, much like yourself. It's not like you, you need to like, okay, what's my homework today? I need to go and find out about something to do with MMA. You're following that anyway because it's your passion. Um, so yeah, there's no particular uh, plan. Most of the things that have been successful have always seemed to feel like they're a no-brainer. That's just like, why, why is no one else doing this? Um, and also just working with the parameters you've got. You know, like look at, I've been so lucky with Vice that they, you know, they've they've done all these things before. Like I'm able to sort of use all that, you know, not just the eyeballs, but the sort of spirit of so much of the stuff they do is not something that I've invented. It's something that they've developed for years. Um, and they've got this really strong brand that people, um, you know, some people really like. So I'm able to just try and in whatever subject I'm working on, just try and put, put it into that, combine that with some of my own thoughts on what makes a good film uh, and, and hope it works. You're talking about um, your team as well. That, was perhaps something that you weren't used to. You've grown, obviously everyone's career evolves. <clears throat> Yours is now <clears throat> as a team leader, managing people. Is that an element that you enjoy? Um, yes. Uh, well, I definitely wouldn't say I don't enjoy it, but it's, it's challenging. And it, I think it sort of um, affects me personally more than any other aspect of it. You know, I take it to heart more uh, when it feels like you're in some way some small way kind of responsible for uh, someone's uh, career trajectory and just life really, you know, like the, everybody, whether they think it or not, like the work part of your life is so important to your just general, how you feel. And I, I'm especially feeling it now because obviously the weird situation I'm in now and also starting a very new job, everything is very much more intense and sort of amplified. So every good day feels way better than a normal good day and every bad day feels much worse because I'm just overly sensitized to everything for a million reasons. It's just a really weird scenario. But to answer your question, yes, um, I do. I do enjoy it. It can be really rewarding, but yeah, it can also hurt. hurt. You know, if you feel like someone you're managing, even if it's not your fault, but for whatever reason, they're just not, not happy or they're frustrated or they feel like they've been hard done by and all these decisions you have to you have to make, you know, sometimes like you can never keep everyone happy. You can talk to every single person and of course they'll all say, well, I'd like to do more of this. I want to do more of this cool stuff. I'd like to get promoted. I'd like to get more money and, you know, I want to do this, this and this. And you listen to it and you're kind of like, cool, I want to make that happen for you because that means you're going to be, uh, you know, happy in your job, but you just can't, you can't look after, you can't just keep everyone happy all the time. And I think part of the, yeah, things that I need to get better at really is not beating myself up about that too much. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just like you, yeah, you, you want people to think that you're a good manager and a lot of that sometimes is out of your hands. Mm. You know, they might think deep down that you're in theory, a good manager, but if you're not giving them what they want to do, even if your hands are tied, mm. you know, it's the same with all of us really, I guess. Do you know what mm. I mean? I'm conscious of the time. Are you, are you, do you have to nip off anytime soon? How long have we got? No, I'm good. I'm you good. good. Yeah. So one of the things that a good friend of mine who works in the city, actually, uh, he, he works in the world where he was, he was with everyone. It's a very social environment. And he loved being at ground zero, working all the angles and, and being one of the guys. And an opportunity has come. He's now, he has now been uh, promoted and he's in a kind of international, flying all over the place, running teams kind of, kind of role. But he, he took that de decision very seriously. How did that? How did that sit with you, uh, with, with your new role, where you become an executive producer? Maybe, maybe you need to uh, describe what the difference is between producing and exec producing, and also what that means creatively. Does it does it take you away from jumping on the train, uh, going up to Glasgow, and does it keep you, you, you know, in in a nice little corner office? And 
what was the thought process and whether you should actually accept it? Yeah, I guess it, it wasn't as sort of defined. It's a bit more of a gradual process, but it's also an inevitability of what I do. You know, when you're making films, television shows, documentaries online, whatever you're doing, um, unless you want to then, I guess, become a, a freelancer where you're just a, a freelance producer, director for hire. If you're staying in-house within a company, then, yeah, there isn't really, you kind of, you're going to have to do that at some point. You're going to have to be more in a sort of managerial role, exec produce commissioning. Um, and it was gradual enough that it was, it felt, it felt fine. It doesn't mean there was never times where people would be going off to, you know, especially with music stuff, if they're going off to work with some artist that I'd sort of built a relationship with for a few years, of course, it's part of me that's like, oh, you know, you work really hard to get to a point and then everyone's flying off around the world and you're at home. But um, it seemed to just work with, you know, other things like my age. And uh, I, I think if, you ha if I hadn't had the chance to do a lot of those things, it would be frustrating. But because I can look back and think about all the festivals and all the documentaries and stuff and travel wise has been incredible, especially Vice, you know, to be able to go to, you know, Japan and South Africa and Mexico and India and uh, Lebanon, all these places with Vice. It's like I can never really sort of complain too much. Plus, the older I get, the more I hate flying. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was just a fairly uh, sort of gradual thing. But, yeah, the difference really simply is that, yeah, rather than being on the ground and actually making things, you're more, yeah, managing the team, but sort of commissioning. So what you're trying to do is, I guess, uh, motivate the team to come up with loads of ideas. Then you sort of look at the ones that you think are interesting, then get them to try and develop them and you sort of bat them around for a while and you try and work them up. Um, and then, yeah, then you're just trying to uh, motivate them to make their pieces as good as possible. And then when they come back with rushes, you're then looking at the edits they make and working with them to try and, uh, you know, make them as impactful as possible. Love it. Um, so it, it is different. It is different. But it wasn't like one day it's like, right, are you ready for the, the move upstairs? Um, and then it becomes a completely different world. Like from very early on at, at, at Vice, I was making things, but also looking at other people, they, some of the younger people's work and giving them uh, feedback. Best place you've been in the world for whatever reason? Oh, God. Uh, for work, you mean? Yeah. Wow. I mean, sometimes it's like the work trip is more um you know memorable necessarily than the place you know sometimes it's not like the place is so amazing but you look back i mean even just like thinking of gonzo tours i remember like a gonzo tours where you're going to york and cardiff but the idea that i was 25 or whatever and on a tour bus with all my friends you know i did i do remember like stopping sometimes like late at night because we'd, we'd have the gigs we'd film them then there'd be like the after parties Zane would dj and we'd basically put all our camera stuff away and just have a party and then got back on the bus and we were still too like energized to sleep. So we'd end up just chatting. And I remember thinking like, I can't believe this is work. Like it's never going to get better than this. Yeah. You, it's never going to get better than this. You have to really like enjoy every moment of this. So I could have been, you know, waking up in, um, you know, Birmingham and then going into this fairly stinking venue and having like some sausage rolls or, you know, or that the, they'd laid out on the table and some crisps. But it still felt amazing. But in terms of places, I mean, definitely the trip, the hip hop in the Holy Land doc, that was just, it was just me and Mike Skinner and Henry, who was the camera, camera guy. Um, and that was it. So like that was the, it was only three of us on it. So the camera, there was only one camera on it. And this guy had to shoot absolutely everything. And our, our schedule was so insane. Like we filmed every day. We basically landed, went straight to film, basically filmed for six days, I think. But we still managed to sort of go out a bit in the evening and it was really exhausting, but it just, uh, it was just a really memorable in terms of just being fun. But yeah, Le Lebanon, I guess, strikes me somewhere that I probably wouldn't have gone, uh, wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to and same with, yeah, I don't know, India and loads of them. Yeah, some amazing stuff. Yeah, I've been to Lebanon. We did a, we did a fight show over there. The, the owners of Cage Warriors were Middle Eastern and... Um, it was, it, we're in a very plush, a very plush hotel in a ballroom. And, and we had a cage underneath the, this great chandelier from what I remember. 
Um, but one thing I do remember, probably, pro probably not such a nice thing to say, but we we're on a roundabout and everyone used their car horns all the time, but also at gunshots I like, I, I, and people with armored tanks and all the holes in buildings as we were like transiting from, from place to place. And we, we weren't there for long. I would imagine if you're covering ground, you saw like culturally some very interesting stuff. Well, it's funny you say about like uh, being in hairy situations and I was like, I'm too scared. I didn't really do that. And I was mainly doing music stuff. So I was fine. But that was actually one exception in Lebanon where in general it was uh, amazing. And we met some really great people and we were staying in, uh, you know, different sort of neighborhoods. But there was one scene that we had to film where we had to go. There's not... It's not so much a refugee camp. I'm not sure exactly how you would call it, but it was a it was a very sort of troubled area with like no um, resources, no sort of running water, everything. It was a really sort of uh, challenging place to live. And yeah, so there was a few hours there where, and they were telling us stories of some reporters who'd been there a few weeks ago that got into like uh, trouble. They got into a sort of fairly nasty confrontation. But it was just like a few hours. But generally, it was an amazing place to be and people were super welcoming. Yeah. I want to indulge in a little grime now, if we may. Please, it seems please. appropriate, given, given our ages, that we should be talking about that genre. Absolutely. Um, what given was how it lame about... and old and middle class I am. <laughs> <laughs> but what was it about this genre of music that really gripped you? Um, well, I guess I was always into like, just like weird, weird sounding music. If you know, if, you know, and I know a lot of like grime has got some big pop hits or whatever, but um a lot of these things where people ask you about music you don't really remember where you were and all that but right, i really right, right. do with this one oh. in that i was i used to always listen to um john kennedy's show on xfm as it used to be called um which was a big mix of stuff there's a lot of guitar music but it was just like new stuff it was like most of it was stuff you you know you wouldn't have heard of um and i really enjoyed listening to that and then i remember so it must have been trying to think what the years would be now maybe 2001 uh and then him just playing this tune i was really into a lot of warp record stuff i don't even know like aphex twin and all of that i was really into the just sort of weird electronic music discordant sounds and all of that and then he started playing this tune i was like oh this sounds like something i would like and then suddenly this like really fast rapping and a london accent came in and it was obviously at that stage the word grime didn't exist and it was I Love You, the Dizzy Rascals tune, who obviously I'd never heard of. Yep. Um, and I was like frantically trying to like, you know, write down the name. And because of, I guess, the record shops that I went to, because I wasn't really into like Garage, which is, I guess, what Grimes sort of came out of. I the was 100% like, a Garage head. 100% Yeah, head. most people were. But to me, I guess the problem was, I don't know if it was because my sister was into it, but to me, I was into loads of just like weird sounding hip hop, like sort of futuristic rap stuff. So for me, it just sounded way too poppy. I didn't really like melodies and all of that. But what, I, about I like... jungle, what about the jungle stuff? Because that yeah. like, Omni Trio and uh, Shy FX and, and, you know, a, a bunch of those guys as well, that was a little harder and that they were quite experimental with the beats. Yeah, I, 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 did, I did like some of that. Um, but yeah, when this thing came out, I was just like, this wasn't like a type of music. This was just one track that I couldn't connect to any other type of music. It didn't sound like anything else, but I became obsessed by it. He played it a few times. I went into some like record shops that I wouldn't normally go to and was asking about it, but no one really had it. And then I just sort of, I just forgot, you know, it's not like now where you can just stream it or whatever, nor YouTube. There was no way of me hearing it. So I'd only heard it like three times or something in my life. And then I started at MTV. And then six months later or something, I was in like a, a video meeting where they play all the new videos that come through. And I was into like Excel Records was like, you know, a, a, a great record label still is. Um, and they were like, oh, here's a new one from like, Excel. And then they played a proper like, sh not shiny, but like a well-produced music video for this track. And so it was really exciting, not just to be able to hear it, but thinking, oh, this is actually going to come out and it's going to get proper backing and could be, could be a thing. Um, so, yeah, so I loved that. And then I became totally obsessed when his first record came out. I still think it's, you know, probably, you know, one of the best British albums ever made, um, Boy in the Corner. And yeah, got really into that. And then the other ones that came out, Wiley had a album, was probably the next one also on XL, I think, Treading on Thin Ice, and then Kano, uh, Home Sweet Home. Um, I used to love their, their, was it Lord of the Mic, where they're under yeah, the Mike, stairs yeah. in someone's house? Yeah, yeah. Jammer's basement. Was it like basement, yeah. house or so? Whose house? Jammer. 
Gemma. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, I remember. Yeah. yeah. So I did really get into all those like albums. I was always, I have always been like a real albums person. You know, I have got to always say whenever people talk about like early grime, like I wasn't going to like uh, Milton Keynes for like Sidewinder raves or whatever. I wasn't like in the scene. I yeah. was listening to all sorts of loads of different kind of music, dance music, uh, rap, guitar stuff. Um, but it was just like these few things I got really into. Um, and we did do a bit of it, like Gonzo, like Zane was always into loads of different stuff. MTV2 was quite a sort of indie guitar station, but because Zane was into so much different sorts of music, we did do stuff with Dizzy and, you know, The Streets and MIA. I think we did bits with Kano. Um, so we did touch on it, but obviously when I went to Vice, 2010 and then doing like music stuff it was like oh okay great i get to sort of do some st stuff around not just grind but just like uk rap stuff in general mm. um because they had a good history of it as well when grind was really in its first peak you know 2004 or five like the, all those artists were like playing at vice parties and there was a thing gr uh, grime grime watch but yeah prance hall was a guy who used to write a thing in vice magazine that was quite uh was quite a big deal in in the small grime world there was it was quite a big deal so yeah so there was a history there so when you contacted grime artists most of them were like oh yeah we, we know vice they didn't know noisy because it just started but they knew vice they knew the venue you know vice owns um old blue last and they'd had a lot of grime events there so yeah so pretty much as soon as i started one of the first shoots i did in 2010 when it was just like yep yeah, you can make music films about any artist you want i was like wow this is good so i did a thing with temper T. I think oh, yeah. that must have been end of 2010. And then we just started doing, we did a Wiley one, which sounds mad saying it now because it's so impossible to pin him down. But we, I did a piece with him, I think must have been the beginning of 2011. Um, not Grime, but also did a thing with Gigs, who I loved then and still I massive fan of. I think I remember seeing that. I, I love it. He scares me, by the way. Like as an individual, he, he does scare me. I remember it might even have been what you guys had shot because there was him interacting with other artists and you can just see it about him. If he doesn't agree with what you're saying, he's like the proper alpha in the room, isn't he? And, uh, and, and I just remember a scene where someone was trying to say that they, like, what was this? Was this on Charlie Sloth's? I, I can't remember, but basically... There was one famous one where he was really funny. I think it was Shepherds Bush Empire, maybe. I think it was backstage... Maybe it was a chip show. I can't remember. But there was, well, everyone had the same opinion that he was just sort of like this quite scary guy who didn't say very much. Yeah. But then he just grabbed the mic. I think he might have had a few drinks and people suddenly realized like he's re actually really funny. Yeah. Um, and yet, all the interactions I've had with him, he's like really, really nice. You know, he's a real, uh, you know, he's family guy. And he's, uh, he's one of those that sort of like, there's all these different like obviously areas in London, different crews, but he seems to be able to mix and is respected by absolutely uh -huh. everyone. Yeah. And that was one of the real lucky things that I was basically just like a fan, a uh, total fanboy, still am. And he couldn't really play shows. Now it seems to be fine. He's playing, obviously plays enormous shows. Plays Wembley Arena. Was it Section 696? Six, six? Yeah, Form 696 was connected to that. But yeah, because of yeah, some of the, uh, well, yeah, the various reasons. But like every time he organized a show, it would just get locked off by, by the police. Right. So the lucky thing was that when we were doing a vice party, we could um, we could get him to play and just not announce it. So that was one of the only ways he could play, really. Um, right. So yeah, so like noisy launch party, and then it was I think vice vice dot com relaunch party or something, and then it was the vice when we launched the TV thing, we got him to play again. So um, yeah, so did a thing with him. I'm trying to think who else, but yeah, basically just did a bunch of stuff. Oh yeah, and then when we launched the YouTube channel in um 2012 and we were looking for like series like sort of little uh, music series that we could do temper t went back to him and, and did a the first thing we did was a series with him and then wasn't that long after that where sort of the two things one was 2014 we did the form 696 documentary which jme hosted and that That's sort of helped cement us in the sort of i guess uh grime and uk rap world as you know, hopefully being supportive. Um, and also not long after that was just finding Big Nasty and just wanting to just make him a star and do everything we possibly could with him because he was just so 
as such a character. You know. Yeah, I, did, I really, uh, that whole, JME Skepti's sister, I've forgotten her name, terrible of me. Really? What, what a family that is. Like, and I, I've, obviously, I think I, I'd heard his music, but then found out he was a vegan as well. And I've got a couple of friends in the vegan community that, that were friends with JME. And I've been to like vegan nights in London and he, he's shown up a couple of times and sort of fanboying out a little bit, but I genuinely like his music. And then his brother, Vicky had had some interaction with him at MTV. And then his sisters is like a, a great a, a DJ and, and journalist, if you like. Talented family, man. Really talented. And I like all yeah, the- There's another one also very talented. He's more sort of like a illustrator. Uh, there's another brother. Oh, right. Um, yeah, yeah. Cr- crazy, <clears throat> crazy talented family. And it's good to see they've done it all by themselves as well. They didn't really need the backing of anyone. They've, like, I've always been one who's trying to call up to get an agent. They were like, fuck them. We're going to do this shit by ourselves and make it work. And it's, and it has worked. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's strange. It probably goes against a lot of the sort of standard rules, you know. Um, yeah. It always used to be like, <laughs> You know, you're just waiting around to get signed in the like the greatest moment. You know, one of the biggest moments of your career is like getting signed. Whereas, uh, yeah, for them and a bunch of other people in in UK music now are just like, we don't, yeah, we don't need to. Mm. Um, let's see if we can just do it on our own and build up enough of a fan base that you can support yourself. And yeah, fair play to them. I like the evolution now as well with the scene where we're seeing different um, accents that really work for that genre and like JK's Moscow for me, I like, I, I just listening to that. I, 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 if it was a tape, I would have worn it out. Um, but even like Bugsy Malone and there's, is it H now as well? There's, there's, yeah. there's a few different, a few different voices out there that I think really, really work. And sometimes I think they, they make you listen more intently as well. Cause it's, it's quite powerful. Yeah. I think it adds, adds a lot to it. I mean, I, I always, compare it to like uh, the first time we heard gigs which is back when i was still at mtv i don't know what year yeah probably talking 2007 or 8 or something and the first time you heard his delivery everyone was a bit like we just wasn't really sure i guess you could say the same for mike skinner the first yeah. time you hear it it's just like this isn't this isn't right it feels weird you know it feels sort of off um and then you sort of listen a few more times and it's like oh, actually yeah, i'm kind of getting into this and then a few months later you're completely obsessed and you've forgotten that it sounded weird yeah. at the beginning um and i think that's probably just the same with with that kind of stuff that originally you're sort of like oh that sounds weird a brahmi accent on on like uk rap music and then you sort of get used to it and then actually you're like you know what there's like a thousands of london you know or southern yeah. accents actually these these are really standing out you know it's people like jk and like mist have got such like really distinctive voices yeah which is half the battle right with rap but like everyone's a rapper so how yeah. can you really stand out and if you've got a distinctive voice like those two like as soon as you hear those two you know immediately who it is yeah and then you've got guys at d double e who's like mainstream commercials and again like his style devlin is someone else as well that i really enjoyed that really raw like angry delivery that he's got fast it's it's i don't know why i really don't know why i enjoy it so much because i don't it doesn't speak to my life or anything like that but neither did yeah. the streets really when I was growing up, but I just indulged in their stuff massively. Yeah. I think you just sort of need to go over it to a certain extent. Yeah. Obviously I'm <laughs> much too old, old and you know, I'm not like in the target demographic or whatever, whatever that means. But yeah. like, you know, if, if you like the music, I say, I mean, I, I've always liked just so much very different stuff and I go to shows, you know, especially more, I guess, nostalgic stuff or stuff I liked back in the day. And like, uh, you know, that's probably considered more what I should be listening to. I listen to lots of stuff that fits in more with my age and background, but some of the stuff it isn't. And I, I, I think it's fine as long as you're sort of respectful about it. You know, I was always wary that like some people are like, oh, you're like the grime guy. And I was like, listen, I'm really not pretending to be any sort of expert. I wasn't there at pirate radio stations back in the day. I'm not a spokesperson for the scene. I just like it. And in the small way, that I could in, in noisy, I've, I've done a few bits on the scene and tried to sort of push it just because I'm a, I'm a fan. Yeah, well, you gotta be careful you don't, what was it, Grime Grandad? Didn't they have Grime Grandad on the Radio One? There was like a uh, little... Yeah, well, there's, a, the, there's Grime Gran, who's Grime uh, Gran. far more importantly, 
But the granddad, there is a, there is a, there is a granddad. I think that was on one extra, maybe. We got, but we got grand, time. Grand yet, right? We got time yet yeah. before you, uh, before you hit that. Exactly. Um, We're not granddad era yet. So. No, exactly that. Let's talk Arsenal then, because uh, that's yes, something please. that uh, we share, and I'm sure that it, you're like, oh god, I've been talking about music for so long now, and and I've been barking on about that. You. You had this wonderful job at Vice, um, a lot of success on that great career trajectory. And when you, you announced kind of on social media, uh, so I've got, I'm making another move coming up. I honestly, you know, I, I sat there for a moment and thought, oh, I wonder what that is. I never, I never thought that it was going to be Arsenal that you, were, that you were alluding to. So how did that come about and how excited are you? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the most fun bits about it, I guess, was just telling people. As you say, it's just like, people weren't really expecting that. I certainly wasn't. When people hear, they're kind of like, oh, you must have been angling at this, like hassling them for a while. And I was like, no, I didn't think of it. Not because I didn't want the job, but just I didn't think that would be, you know, I didn't have sports background. I, I don't know why. I just didn't really think about it. And also the chances of like a, a job coming up that is suitable for me at that time is just, you know, what are the odds? It's, it's really unlikely. Um, so yeah, it was just completely out of the blue. I wasn't like looking to leave particularly I, I was you know love love my job there but yeah I just got approached randomly by someone just like would you be interested you know there's a job potential job going at a sports club so I was like well this is going to be a fairly short conversation they're not saying who it is so <laughs> I'm just going to ask and if it's a rugby club then I have no knowledge or, or right. passion for rugby and if it's a football club I'm probably too immature to well, not immature. I just I wouldn't be the right person to do it for a team that isn't my team. Like, there's yeah. only a limited number of teams that are going to have a media department like that. So, you know, it's not going to be Barnet. Do you know what I mean? It was only going to be, you know, one of the bigger teams. So I was just like, well, this is going to be a short conversation. It's like, if it's what I want to hear, then I'm definitely interested. If it's not, then I'm probably not the person to do it. Right. Um, so yeah, so then they were just like chatting about what sort of role it could be, could be interesting. And I was like, oh, what's the, uh, what's the team? And then when they said, I'm like, yeah, you could say I'm interested, you know, because yeah. I've been going since 1985. Um, and yeah, just really passionate. I guess it's going back to what we're talking about music. It's not like get a new job and it's like, right, I'm going to need to do loads of research now, find out what this is all about. Obviously, I spend far too much of my time thinking and worrying about about Arsenal anyway, so I may as well put it to some sort of use. Uh, are you one of those fans? Because I have to confess, uh, my mind, my brain, I'm good at cramming. I'm good at revising for an exam, <clears throat> but my recall is hopeless. And although I've had a season ticket for a long time, I haven't been, I don't keep hold of it these days. I, I give it to my sister. Um, but I, I honestly can't recall the games. Like, I, and I've been there. I was thinking earlier, what was that game where Vicky came along and I think we put seven past. I'm like, was it standard Liège? I'm like, I can't, I can't remember. So, yeah. uh, so I'm one of those that I would have to go back and, and, and kind of consume everything again. But how exciting to, to put those two together. But you, you had said earlier about your, your football programs. Were you, are you one of those people with the memories of all of the games where you were when, you know, Ian Wright scored nah. his goal and it's weird. It's just all kind of all over the place. And the, the older you get, you know, I'll just have no memory of, I, I don't remember much about recent games, but then there will be some, some ones that just jump out and suddenly you'll remember like a substitution that happened. And yeah, I mean, you know, no what way. brains are like, yeah. Like Monday, <laughs> just, he was always a yeah, substitute. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So those are really obscure players and games I'll remember. And then, won't remember major things in my life that I should know. Yeah. Um, but in general, I mean, just like the culture of, of the club and, you know, and also just because you care about the club, you want to, you know, you want to promote a good, you know, image of it. So, you know, it, it just means that quite a lot of the stuff that might, you might need to really think about before, hopefully some of that, you know, comes naturally to me because, you know, I, I, I want to be excited about the club and I want to, I want other people to, you know, you love it when you meet someone and you realize they're a gooner or if you meet someone that sort of kind of is. And then a few years later, they're like really getting into it. You know, I love the idea of people watching some of our content and it in some way helping to like get them really uh, passionate about the club. Because I know what I was like when I was young. It's not just about 
the games, you know, like for my era, probably you're similar. So much of it was just about Ian Wright and mm. the fact that he was just so, not just an amazing player, but everything about his personality just made you want to, you just, that had to be your club because of this guy. He yeah. just made you love football and everything about him. Yeah, yeah, I've shared some great stories or learned some great stories from Vicky's dad, my father-in-law. He grew up in Islington and remembers falling out of pubs and clubs with certain players over the years. And his friends, like he's got a couple of friends that have a share in Arsenal. It's all very exciting. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. I mean, I can go back. Those, those. I like those stories as well, not just the performances on the pitch. But what, what's your remit going to be down at Arsenal? Well, it's obviously, uh, you know, it's all very new. So we're just working it out. And uh, what my remit was going to be is maybe a bit different now because we're, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's this weird uh, thing going on at the moment, this whole yeah, virus thing. Told me. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, in general, just, uh, you know, looking after the video, the video side of what the, what the club does. So that's a whole, a whole range of things. Um, some of which is stuff that, you know, you might, you might uh, see. Um, stuff on on YouTube or on on Arsenal.com, etc. Socials, but some of it is also uh, stuff that gets sort of sent around the world. You know, there's other places around the world that will like take uh, Arsenal content, uh, match stuff, or all sorts of stuff. So it ranges from things like you know covering the, the games and press conferences and interviews and all that stuff, but also just content generally. Yeah. So uh, in some ways, it's not that dissimilar you know some people are like wow that's like a crazy different change and it's obviously different kind of subject but um it's the same thing you're trying to make uh content that's going to be impactful and is going to promote the sort of values of the club and just get people excited about the club and also just give fans what they want you know a lot of it is just informative you know they're going to want to see the boss's press conference and see the highlights and be kept up to date I don't know if, it, if it's just my take on this, but I feel like recently, and when I say recently, I use that term loosely, so it could be in the last year, but Arsenal's tone on social media seems to have changed quite a bit. I feel like it really speaks to a younger audience now. They, it, it's a lot more engaging. I've always felt like the, the in the in-stadium experience is quite refined compared to maybe some other clubs. But online, I really feel like they've, they've, they're pushing boundaries a lot more. Has there been change there? Or am I right in feeling like this? And is it something that you've recognised? Well, obviously, I'm, only, I'm only very new and I don't specifically look after the sort of um, social media that people are actually posting. And, but I think, I think most places, most companies, and not just football clubs, all companies are, you know, are starting to realise that there's loads of different platforms, loads of ways of reaching uh, you know, your consumers, want a bit of a word, and there's going to be different sorts of people on each one. Mm. Uh, and there's probably no point having the exact same tone uh, everywhere you go. You know, there's going to be different people that are going to buy the program um, or you're going to, I don't know, yeah, go to the club shop. There's all, all sorts of different ways. And in terms of social media, I guess it is a bit, bit younger. And I yeah. guess you don't want to seem completely out of touch. Uh, or just know without any sort of human feel to it. You know, you don't want to feel like you're just posting factual things. You want to feel like there's some charisma there. But yeah, I mean, the answer is I don't really know. I think, um, yeah, that has obviously been mentioned. And a lot of people say like, you know, oh, I follow Arsenal and stuff. It's, it's really, you know, they've got a really good, I think they have a reputation for a really good social media team. Yeah. So hopefully uh, that will continue. Is your, is your first um, strategy to integrate Arsenal Fan TV into the walls of London Colney is uh... <laughs> uh, if it was I'm not sure I'd have much joy with that but uh, to be honest that really hasn't been mentioned it got mentioned by everyone obviously when I um, told people that I'd got the job and some people got confused and like oh yeah I know that thing yeah Arsenal Fan TV and I was like no it's not it's not that but no honestly that hasn't been mentioned since I've, I've been there so I don't think it's either way I don't think it's like they're going to be uh, all coming and doing official stuff at the club anytime soon. But I also yeah. don't think there's some like crazy like beef or whatever with the, sure. with the club. They're, they're all passionate fans at the end of the day, aren't they? So. Absolutely. Is your office down in London or is it in London Colney? Uh, no, it's in, yeah, it's in uh, Highbury. Right. Okay. It's a Hi Highbury house. Yeah, it's next to, next to the ground. Great. Okay. Yeah, because where we live is not far from the training ground, which is which is kind of yeah. 
Alex Song used to have a, a black and orange uh, Porsche SUV. And he's, he's actually on a road that is kind of between us, if you like. Uh, it makes us sound like we live in these great palatial places. But I, I don't know about your spot. I have a very small piece of real estate in, a, in our town. But I did used to enjoy seeing like Lauren, um, Oxlade Chamberlain used to be in and out of Tesco's and burning up the road. Sanya. Yeah, so, Sanya used to drop his kid, kid off at the school uh, next, to our, next to our place. Right. Yeah, it's really near the training ground. So yeah, that, that's obviously the dream is just to go there, that, have my office there. You never know, one day. Well, I'm still hoping, obviously, to be involved in first team, uh, first team football. I know I'm a bit old, but <laughs> never know. Once, once Mikel sees what I've got to offer. Hey, I'm listen, still... never say never. Annoyingly, this whole corona thing has sort of slightly put that back, but you never know. Well, you know, if, if you remain healthy and a few others get struck down, God forbid, then it could be slimmer pickings. I'm not saying too much, but you could, there could be a potential opening. Yeah, probably more chance for you, I'd imagine. Slightly fitter, <laughs> slightly fitter and younger. Who are you really excited about putting on the Arsenal shirt when the season comes back in whatever form that takes? Well, uh, of course, like the, the big sort of, you know, hasn't been a legendary season for us, although everything seems much more positive now. Everyone seems very uh, excited about the new gaffer. But yeah, of course, the two big uh, positives has been the two 18-year-olds that are... Uh, Seemed like as as good a couple of eighteen year olds. I don't know. Maybe in world football. Maybe I'm getting yeah. slightly overexcited. Yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, Saka and Martinelli. Mm. Uh, you know, if they were sort of twenty twenty one and playing like this, you'd be like, wow, we've got some good youngsters here. But to be eighteen, yeah, it's amazing. So it's been the, one of the big bright spots, I guess, of this this year. And it must be really. I mean, it's gutting for all players, but especially ones that are just really making their name and getting in. It's just like, it's just something no one ever thought about that suddenly there'd be no, no games and no idea when it's going to come back. Yeah. So yeah, those two. And it, I don't know if that's going to work in their favor, maybe being so young, it gives them another year of maturity. Um, you, you know, football clubs have such a fantastic infrastructure of support compared to like the sport that I'm involved in, which is very much your coach in your, provincial town in your club whatever but these guys will be guided through that so another year of maturity m might help them develop physically develop as well they are such super talents i'm i'm looking forward to seeing kieran tierney come back but of course saka in that position as well i, I don't know how they're going to work that out good problem for the gaffer as they say yeah absolutely yeah it's a good point i guess tierney you almost like forgot because he we were excited to see him play and then played a couple of games and got injured again but Seems like a good, yeah, good talent. And uh, yeah, I'll see what he does there because Saka, probably, by all accounts, I don't know whether he wants to play at left back, but I think they're going to have to find a place for him somewhere because he's just, mm. yeah, it just looks amazing. Yeah. yeah. Your favourite favorite sort of team over the years? What was the favourite phase of Arsenal? Obviously, the Invincibles was, was incredible. Or maybe there's a couple of players that you just fell in love with. Well, uh, obviously mentioned rightly, you know, when you were, Younger, those things have more impact. Like the 93 Cup final was a really big one for me. But yeah, it definitely has to be the 98 season, mainly because that was my first year in Manchester. So to be living in Manchester and having such big rivalry with them. Um, and, and then going to Old Trafford for that, that game where we won 1-0. Um, it was just nice to be in, a, in, a, in the city of like the biggest, by far the biggest, most powerful this you know giant club and us who obviously before then weren't really title contenders to suddenly be like you know better than them was was incredible um obviously it then slightly backfired on me the next season when i was living in manchester and and they won the treble and like everyone just all these students just come like running out onto the street when they won the treble even if they have no interest in football yeah and i remember just just watching this all and be like i'm getting out of here and just got in my car and drove to scotland to see my mate because i just yeah. <laughs> not good times not good times no no hopefully they hopefully the better times uh, will return I'm, I really like Arteta I, I feel like he says all the right things but I don't think that's a I don't think it's a, necessarily a, 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 res, a scripted response I genuinely feel like he his development through his career has given him these tools and 
and I believe what he says. And and I think that he's he's got the dressing room on side, which is which is fantastic. It's obviously a shame now with the stuttering of of the season. But again, it might it might work in in the favour of Arsenal Football Club. I, I I really don't know in terms of their sort of medium term development. Yeah, who knows? But yeah, I agree. It just feels like. Um, you know, there are various managers' ideas knocking about and other clubs have done the same where you're sort of going for managers that feel a bit on the sort of merry-go-round and you don't have any great faith that they're going to be there for that long. They might have some short-term success, whereas obviously people like us, we're used to a longer-term situation. Um, and yeah, he definitely feels like hopefully someone that could be there for a long time. Because, you know, looking around, it's just, it just doesn't work, the whole just chopping and changing the whole time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed he's going to be there for a, for a long time and have good success. Nice one. And where do you sit in the ground with your season ticket? Well, actually, recently, yeah, I've been moving about. I was always um, West Upper at Highbury. Then I was East Upper at Emirates. But the last few years, I've sort of been a bit dotted around. I haven't had the same seat every time. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll be, I, I will be, I guess, from next season, have, have a solid seat again. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. You'll probably get the meal accompanying every game as well. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Well, yeah, I, I guess I'll be working some, some match days. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's all, so, uh, it's all to be TBC because God knows when football's coming back. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see the game from the other side, from sort of working, working side. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on doing stuff behind closed doors? It's something that we're, we've already done in the UFC. I wasn't on the broadcast. It was in Brazil. It was the, the, the last one before lockdown was imposed. And it was, it was different. But actually, the fans were, were good. There was some humility shown and they were noticing things about the cornering, for example. They could hear the corners. So you're going to be able to hear the managers if indeed they do behind closed doors. There were certain elements that they actually saw the benefit of rather than being so down on the, the lack of energy of the fans. So It all remains to be seen, I guess. I'm sure there's so much planning and stuff going on behind the scenes to have all eventualities, but it does seem very unlikely that there won't be some behind closed door stuff. But I feel like most people are just, you know, are smart people that they're like, listen, this is a completely unprecedented situation. Um, of course, it's going to be weird. And everyone would prefer if it just football was off for a bit and then it comes back exactly as it was. But it just doesn't seem, doesn't seem possible. So it's just a, you know, just that option of like how close can we get to an authentic experience? And if it doesn't seem close enough, then is it worth doing? And I'm sure all the people involved will, um, you know, will make the right decision. But of course, people just want to see, want to see football. Most people see it on telly. So I hope, I guess they'll just do as much as they can to make the TV proposition as close to what it was before as possible. Um, and hopefully it will just be a short, short period of time. But yeah. yeah, it'd be good to, good to have it back. I mean, just as a fan, it'd be good to have it back. But obviously for me, it's yeah, very strange time to join the club where I haven't even gone in for a day's work in the office and everything about the club is just so revolved around match days. Yeah. And, it's the unprecedented time that nobody in the club could tell you when the next match day is because nobody knows. Yeah, absolutely bonkers. Alex, thank you so much for all of your time sharing your journey with me. I've enjoyed no worries, it immensely. Um, I haven't, in my research for this, I was going back like through old CD covers thinking oh, yeah, I'm racking the brain about music and that. So it's been a, Probably I've indulged before this has, has, been, has been a positive experience as well. So, so I, I thank you for that. Nice Hopefully one, man. Good can, hanging out. We can uh, get, to share a, get to share a beer, watch a game, if you're not working, perhaps, or you know, a rerun, whatever it might be. Yeah, in real life. Imagine that. Can you imagine? God damn. Um, mate, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. All the best to the family. And, um, Likewise. Yeah, let's stay in touch. Take it easy. See you, man. Cheers, mate. A good one, right? I hope you enjoyed that. Alex, a very cool guy, done some great work in some interesting industries as well. So I'm, I'm sure that there was so much that you could have taken from that. Why don't you go say hi and tell him where you, where you found him. If you do a little search in Twitter, Alex Hoffman, you'll see he's the one with a blue tick. I think he'd be a great person to get some nuggets of advice if you're someone who's looking to break into a, a creative type space. 
Thank you very much for watching as always. This is a growing channel of mine, so I can really do appreciate any support. You can give it any shares, any of that stuff. As I've said before, you can go and listen to the conversations I had with Paul Felder about acting, there's Taylor about art, and John Anik about broadcasting. These aren't really timestamps, so I think they'll still make for good listening whenever you decide to indulge in a little John Gooden for the love of action. All right, until the next time, I'm about to go and embark on a very complicated journey over to Fight Island. So I will speak to you probably from the desert very soon. Adios.